our psalm for tonight, the scripture is coming from Psalm 96, 1 through 8a. And it says, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish the glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. All nations of the world recognize the Lord. Recognize the Lord is glorious and strong. Verse 8 says, give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Our God, our great God is worthy of all the praise and all of the honor for the great things he has done for us. The most important thing that God has done for me is saved my soul. And I know you can attest to that too. And I know if God saved me, guess what? He wants me to tell others about him, how he died, how he bled, he was buried, and how he rose again on that third day morning. And the scripture says if you can believe that story, guess what? You can be saved too. So we are going to give God glory, give him honor and praise for everything that he has done in our lives. Give glory to God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that your word is medicine and your word is strength to us, Father. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us as we come before you on tonight. We pray that you bless us, Father God, that we will be ones who will hear from you. 
We pray that your word is clear. We pray that your word goes forth, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls will be made the difference. We ask you, Father God, to bless those who are listening, those who will attend. We pray, Father God, that you bless us that we will hear a word from on high from you. Not only that, Father God, bless us that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word only. And bless us, Father God, that we will be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. Send the strong, mighty, anointed, and powerful name of Jesus of Christ, we pray, and we ask it all. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Thank you again for joining us here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for constantly being a part of our service. We're glad that you can join us again on tonight. We're glad that you can join us one more again. And we praise God for the privilege of studying his word again as we have many other Wednesday nights. Our focus tonight will be Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And somebody going to claim their favorite verse on tonight. And I want to make sure that we clear up what this favorite verse is really talking about. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Those of you who have been joining us, I warned you on last week that we will clear up what uh, this verse 13 is really talking about. So we will lift our voices and lift our ears toward it on tonight. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I was tempted to deal with verse 14 also, but my pericope in my Bible stops at 13. I didn't want to stop at 13. I wanted to go into 14, but my Bible pericope, the author has laid it out to the point where it stops in 13. A pericope is a complete thought, one complete thought. So every Bible has its own way of identifying those pericopes. Some Bibles identify a complete thought or a pericope by indicating in bold letters uh, a subject matter. Mine says uh, Philippians generosity. That's what mine says here tonight. Some Bibles identify pericope by what we call a backwards P, a backwards P, and that backwards P indicate the beginning of that thought. And then when you see another Baptist P, backwards P, it indicates the beginning of a new thought. Uh, other Bibles have the first letter in the pericope capitalized, and it has that letter in dark, dark, bold writing. So the pericope for tonight, a pericope means what? A complete thought, one complete thought. So in order to stay within my pericope, I'm going to stop at verse number 13, if you don't mind tonight. Amen? So every pericope gives us one complete thought. What is a pericope? One complete thought. So the author gives us thoughts. Remember, the Bible was not written in paragraphs. The Bible was not written in verses. The Bible was a continual stroll that was written. And therefore, uh, the modern day Bible gives us pericopes where it breaks down a complete thought. Amen? Amen. Thank you again for joining us. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13 is where we are. Verse 10 says, but I rejoice. When we see the word but, we got to stop and look back and see what we're talking about. On well, last week, I gave you a list of words that Paul says we ought to be like. Paul says our mannerism ought to be like. Paul says that our minds and our focus ought to be like these things. He says we ought to be noble. We ought to be true. We ought to be just. We ought to be pure. We ought to be of good report. Ought to have a good reputation. If there be any virtue, these things ought to be those things that are praiseworthy. We ought to consider, consider these things praiseworthy. The things which you have learned, the things that you have received, the things that you have heard and the things that you have saw in me, do these things and then the God of peace will be with you. I ended last week by telling you not only should we have peace, but not only should we have the peace of God, we ought to also realize that we have the peace of God 
and realize that we have the God of peace. Yes, it's not enough to know that we have peace. And this peace surpasses all understanding. But not only should we have peace, and we realize that that peace is rest, that peace is tranquility, that peace also comes from God. And because that peace comes from God, not only do we have the peace of God, we have the God of peace. That's good to note. That's good to note because as we have the God of peace, we realize that God, the God of peace, is the one that keeps us in perfect peace as we keep our minds and our hearts stayed on Jesus. Thank God that we have the God of peace. One thing about it, to have the benefit of peace, but when you have the God of peace, you have the only true and the living God. And so when you don't need peace and you already have, have tranquility, then God is there for you in other reasons and other things also. Amen? Thank God we have the God of peace. He says, but, verse number 10, he says, but, so because we have the God of peace, he says to them, now you have the God of peace. Then he says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Paul talked to the Philippian church early on in, in the previous pericopes. He talked to them about the fact that he appreciated them. He appreciate their generosity. He, he appreciate their giving toward them. He appreciate their hearts toward them. He appreciate them partnering with him in ministry. Not only did they partner in ministry, but he also appreciate the fact that they partner with him financially. Every preacher, every missionary, every teacher, Every person that's about God's business needs someone to partner with them in ministry. Every pastor needs someone to partner with them financially. So when we look at this text, we find that Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. The interpretation here is, that the Philippian church had been given to Paul's ministry financially. They have been in support of Paul's ministry and morally, and they had been in support of Paul's ministry by repeating what Paul has said. He says to them in the previous verses, whatever you do, what you have learned, what you have heard, what you have seen in me, do these things, what you have received from me, Live like this. Let me be the example for you. Anytime your pastor tells you, let me be an example for you, it doesn't mean that your pastor is perfect. It doesn't mean that your Christian that you walk with is perfect. It doesn't mean that your family member is perfect. It doesn't mean that your neighbor is perfect. What it does mean is that I am setting a godly example before you. And as I set a godly example before you, whenever you do, make sure you do these things that you've heard of me, that you've seen in me, the, seeing the things that you watch me do, the things that you have received of me, do these things. He says, I rejoice greatly. Now at last, that you surely did come to the point where you care for me and your care has flourished again. The situation here is that Paul was on a missionary journey and he was also on house arrest as well as in prison. When Paul being on house arrest could not leave the house and when he was in prison, he couldn't leave the prison, they put something on his books. <laughs> uh, if you ever been to prison, ever been to jail, you know that you wait for somebody to put something on your books. And when they put something on your books, Sister Davis, what that really means is, I know you've never been in jail and you were born as a goody two-shoe and, and you've never done anything wrong. But when they put something on your books, Sister, that means you got something that you can use to buy something with. 
Put something on your book. Now, people go, they buy candy, they buy, buy things that they can't get in the prison, can't get in jail. So they were, they were responsible, and they were real responsible in doing it, putting stuff on his books. I'm going to tell you something. One of these days, you may need somebody to put something on your books. <laughs> One of these days, you may need somebody to give you something that you can't get for yourself. Paul says that I'm so glad at last your care for me has flourished again. First thing he says is I rejoice in the fact. This word rejoice means that I'm, I'm cheerful. I have been made glad. Mm -hmm. I rejoice in the fact. And then not only does the word rejoice means that he's excited about it, the word rejoice also means Farewell. The word rejoice, I told you two weeks ago, as well as last week, in some instances, this word rejoice means God's speed. Mm -hmm. This word rejoice is not only just a greeting, it's not only that you're happy, but it is a greeting, it is a farewell message also. Paul is saying here, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 10, he says, I rejoice in the, word, in the Lord greatly for your care for me has flourished again. Mm -hmm. Flourished mean that, that it, it, has, it, has, it has rose up again. It has been revived again. Paul says, I'm so glad that your care for me has risen again. He said it has been revived. Now, sometimes Paul were, was in need. The Philippian church could not get money to him, could not get anything that he needed to him. He's saying now that I'm so glad that your care for me, your care package has gotten to me again. He says, uh, though you surely did care, although you cared, I'm glad that it has been shown again. We oftentimes talk about love. We oftentimes talk about what love means. Let me tell you, as some would put it, love is an action word. It's an action word. It's something that you do. You ought to do love. You ought to, you ought to act like you have love. Through your actions, people ought to see your love for each other and for one another. Paul says here that I'm so glad that, that your love for me has flourished again. Your love for me has been revived again. Your love for me has been aroused again. Paul says that, that your love for me has been revived. And he, he says it's evident. It's evident that it's been revived. Though you were surely, though you surely, though you surely, Without a doubt, you have surely did, you surely did care for me. Let me tell you something. If people know you care, if people know you love them, if people know you're concerned, this word care means you regarded me again. You, you regarded me. You, you, you have a savor for me. This word care means that there's, there's an intensity about you that you're interested in me. Paul says you're thoughtful of me. He said I appreciate you. Whenever somebody does something good for you, you ought to appreciate them. Paul says I appreciate you because your care has flourished again. Your care for me has shown up again. And I understand one thing. Look at verse number 10. He says, and I understand one thing really well. You lacked opportunity. It's, it's one thing to not give. It's one thing to not support. But it's a total different thing when you want to support, but you don't have the opportunity. The word opportunity means occasion. It means the season. He's saying that you didn't have the season to give. You didn't have the opportunity to give. You didn't have the occasion to give. Remember now, Paul is talking to the Philippian church, telling them that they didn't have opportunity. Now, one reason why they didn't have opportunity is because they didn't have the opportunity to send it to him. 
A reason why they didn't have an opportunity to send it to him is because they didn't have a messenger to get it to him. Later on, you're going to find out Epaphroditus that we mentioned earlier in other verses. Epaphroditus was responsible for taking Paul's gift to him. So they didn't have an opportunity because they didn't have a runner to get it to him. He says, I'm so glad to know I rejoice in knowing the fact that the Lord has, has greatly blessed me with you. This Lord, the Supreme One, this Lord, the author of authority, this Lord, Lord himself, the controller, my master, my master has given me the opportunity to be a part of you. He has given you the opportunity to be a part of me and you the opportunity to be a part of my ministry. He says, I'm thankful for that. He says, I'm so glad that the opportunity, <laughs> you used to have an opportunity, and when you had an opportunity, you shared with me. The problem is, people have great opportunities every day, and they will not share. The window, the window of opportunity, I tell young people, the window of opportunity is just this big. And when the opportunity shows up, you have to jump through that window of opportunity while the window is up. Nice. I didn't say you need to walk through the door. I said you need to jump through the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is only so big. And it stays open for a little while. Mm -hmm. The window of opportunity is so small until it's going to close in a little while. When people pass away, people always saying, I wish I had another day with that person. I wish I had had another time to talk to him. But let me tell you, you have opportunities today. You need to make sure you hold on and you use your opportunity. When a person is dead, it's too late to spend time with them. When a person is dead, it's too late to give to them. The window of opportunity is so small until you need to take that opportunity, every chance you get, to be a blessing to somebody. Paul says, now, the Philippian church, you lack opportunity. You didn't have this opportunity. And because you didn't have the opportunity, I'm so glad that the revival is still in you that you want to give to me. You know, there are some people that look for opportunities to give to their pastor. There are some people who will call the pastor and say, hey, I got a biscuit, I want to share it with you. There are some people, even at the New Beginning Church, there are people who look for ways to bless the pastor. And I'm appreciative of that. I'm appreciative of you using that little window of opportunity. He says, I rejoice, I, I, I rejoice. The Lord has given you the opportunity at last. I thank God for your care for me. It has flourished again through you surely. Uh, uh, in the fact, though you surely had the opportunity, you, you made sure that you dealt with this opportunity. He says, though you surely did care, even though you cared, Though you really cared, you lacked opportunity. You didn't have the opportunity. What he said to them is, I know your heart. And your heart is, if you had an opportunity, you would have shared. Yeah. But because you lacked opportunity, you didn't share. It's a good thing when you know a, part, a person's heart, even if the gift doesn't make it to you. You know their heart is one that if they had the opportunity, they would give it to you. That's what he's saying to the Philippian church. He says, through your opportunities, you gave to me. And then he says, though you did not have opportunities, I know in your heart you wanted to give to me. You would have done it, but you lacked opportunity. You lacked the occasion. You, you lacked the season. You lacked it. You were short of it. And because you didn't have this opportunity, that's the only reason why you didn't give. My question to you today, my dear, is, is it a lack of opportunity? Or is it that you're stingy? Or is it that you say you don't have? You know, I, I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Pastor, when I hit it big, we're going to pay this church off. 
My reply is, don't wait till you hit it big. Give what you can give now because your little bit becomes much when it's in the hand of God. Don't, don't wait, don't wait. You see, people like to make a parade of what they give. People like to make a show of what they give. People like the pomp and circumstances of what they give. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, this woman that gave her last might, she gave more than all of you because she gave her last. Right. But people like, they're fair see it. Oh, I'm going to really give. When I get $400,000, Pastor, I'm going to really give. Mm -hmm. And you want to give the church $40,000. But if, if the Lord has really blessed you with $400,000, 40,000 ought to be the starting point. Yeah, yeah, you need to make sure you need to make sure that you consistently give even when it's just a little bit. You give 10% of what you have. Give 10% of what God has blessed you with because if you can give 10% of $5, God can trust you with 50. If you can't give 10% of five hundred dollars, why would God trust you with five thousand? Don't don't wait, don't wait till you make it big. Don't don't wait till they call your six or seven numbers. Don't wait till they call your three digits. Give as you can give now. Bless the Lord now. Bless the men of God now. It's in the text. It's in the text. Look, look at what Paul says. Paul, Paul says in verse number 10, the only reason you didn't give is because you didn't have the opportunity or the season or you didn't have the person to bring it to me. Are you with me? Verse number 11. Not that I speak in regard of need. Paul says, I'm not speaking in God, in, in, in regards of need. Paul says in verse number 11, Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, I'm not talking this way. I'm not telling you to take advantage of the opportunity because I need anything. He, he says, it's not that I fall, I'm falling short. It's not that I have want. Paul says, I'm not preaching this thing to you about giving to me because I'm selfish. Because it is true, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul is saying to us that we need to know that it's a blessing for us to give. Even to the man of God. This is, this is a good pastor's anniversary sermon here. This is, this is a good phrase to talk about giving to the man of God. He says, not that I speak in regard of need or to need. I don't speak because I need anything. I don't speak because I want something. I don't speak because I'm falling short of anything. He says, not that I'm speaking in regards of need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. Mm -hmm. Verse number 11, Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. Now, let me just stop and tell you, saints. Paul was not content when he first got saved. The word learn mean, means that he had to get to a point where he understands. And when you're first saved, you don't understand Paul had to go through some things in order to have an understanding. And you are going to have to go through some things in order to have an understanding. Paul says he has learned. He, he says that he has learned. He has gotten to a point where he has learned in whatsoever state, this word state, place. Whatever place I'm in, whatever state I'm in, whatever place I am in, I have learned to be content. It's a learning process. It's a daily learning process. It's a process of walking with God daily. And as you walk with God daily, you begin to learn something.
some things. You begin to understand things a little better by now, by and by. When I grew up as, as a boy, I didn't know. I didn't know why mom and daddy did what they did. And yeah, I like children today. We thought that they were old fogey. And you know, I really didn't understand it until I got children of my own. And I understand it better. It is not in the by and by yet. <laughs> I understand it better. Now, I understand every word they said. You know, the problem, the problem with us as humans is that many times we don't learn the lesson until the lesson is in our hands. We don't learn the lesson until it's time for us to teach the lesson. We don't contemplate, we don't meditate on the lesson until it's time for us to reveal to others what our lesson is really all about. Paul says that I've learned, I've, I, I lived through some things, I've, I've seen some things. If the songwriter was here, he would say, I've, I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roll. I've seen the sin breakers dashing. Trying to conquer my soul. You have to go through some things in order to get to a point where you learn to be content. Mm -hmm. The word content means a, a self-complacency. This word content means to be contained. I've learned how to be contained. I've learned how to be content. I've learned how to be satisfied with what God has blessed me with. Every year, every year, my daughter asks the question, Dad, what you want for Father's Day? My, 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 my statement is the same. I want my daddy healed when he was living. I want my daddy healed and my daughter to live. Today, I want my wife healed and I want my daughter to live. It's more important to me that my family live a precious life in the name of the Lord it's more, more important to me that my family live a wholesome, healthy life than it is to get stuff. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I, I, I can't think of anything I really need. There's some things that I like to have. There's some things, some places I like to go. But there's nothing in this world that I really need if I can't get it from Jesus. I may have just shot myself in the foot, the head, the arm, or somewhere. But the fact of the matter is, as we approach verse number 13 of Philippians chapter 4, you'll see what I mean. Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state to be content. I have learned to be composed. I've learned to be contained. I've learned to be self-complacent. I've learned to be. Are you ever content with anything? <laughs> or you just live your life wanting more? That's what that's what um, white collar crime leads to. White collar crime is greed on top of greed. Why would a man need to steal millions of dollars when he make millions? How much is enough? How why would a man have to take more? from the poor in order to give to the rich. How much is enough? We just, we just experienced it. We just experienced it. We, 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 we had $2 trillion for those who were in need. And within two weeks, $2 trillion dissipated in midair find out that it was those who were in greed and not those who were in need that ended up with the two trillion dollars. I mean, people and organizations who already was at the top of the chain and the money will never make it at the bottom of the chain because of those at the top of the chain taking it. And the money was meant for small businesses, but large business are taking over and taking advantage and stealing off the top. How much, 
is too much. How much is enough? Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therein to be content, to be self-contained, to be contained, to be self-complacent. I've learned to be satisfied. Some people are not satisfied with anything. Mm -hmm. I told you the story of a young boy who got a car, brand new car, BMW, Mercedes, or whatever it was, at the age of 21. And because his parents didn't give him the kind of car he wanted, he pushed it off into running water. Said, this is not what I want. <laughs> Woo-wee, Lord have mercy. He had the wrong parents. He had the wrong parents. He had the wrong parents because in... In 1983, when I graduated, Daddy gave me a 78, and I was tickled peak. I loved it to the to the to the death. I drove it everywhere. I polished it and everything. I was appreciative of it because people don't have to do anything for you. Matter of fact, Mom and Daddy didn't owe you anything. You may think that they owe you something. The only thing they owe you is a place to stay something to eat, and an education, and most of us live beyond that point and they still give it to us. We have to learn to be content. We have to learn to be contained. We have to learn to be satisfied with whatever the Lord blesses us with. I grew up hearing these words. If it doesn't belong to you, don't touch it. Daddy was saying, if you go to jail for stealing or for drugs, don't call me. You can stay in there and rot. And he says, if I finally make up my mind to come down there. And of course, I can't tell you exactly what daddy had to say, but he said that if I ever come down there, you're going to beg them to keep you locked up because that crazy black, blank, blank, blank standing out there is going to kill me when I get out. <laughs> so he said to us, whatever you do, don't get caught up in drugs and don't steal anything because you don't have to steal anything because if I can't get it for you, you don't need it. And if you can't make it for yourself, you shouldn't touch it. It's people that's not that's not contented with what they have. They steal anything. There are people today that's that's broke, but they'll go and get something that they don't need because they like it. They'll go get a car they don't need. They'll go get a house note they don't need. They, they'll go get clothing they don't need. I remember counseling a couple and the couple, and they gave me permission to talk about it. The couple said. The, the man said, man, I, I just can't live like this because she she's buying so many shoes. I thought I'd never have to counsel through some, somebody counsel somebody through buying shoes. So, well, sister, how many shoes you? Oh, I buy three pair a week. Three pair of shoes a week? I want to tell her I'm glad she ain't my wife. Three pair of shoes a week. Three pair of shoes a week. So one of my recommendations in the counseling session was don't buy another pair of shoes for the next three months. You would think that I had slapped that woman in that counseling session. You would think that I had stolen from her house in that counseling session. But in order to get her marriage back on track, I had to ask her to not buy another pair of shoes in three months. She had to learn to be content with what her, she could afford and what her husband could afford. We got to learn to be content. We, have, we can't buy new stuff and get new stuff just because we like new stuff. We have to get to a point where we are content. Paul says, not only have I learned to be content, I've learned to be, be a base and I've learned to be a bound. Look at look at look at what look at what, what Paul says in verse number 12. He says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. 
in everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and both to suffer need. We need to understand that we're going to have to suffer through some things. We're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to go through. So Paul says, I have learned over a period of time. I have learned through suffering how to be both be a base. This word a base means to be depressed. And he's not talking about depressed in his spirit. He's saying he's learned to come down a notch. He has learned how to be humiliated. This word, this word of base means humiliation. This word of base means to bring low. This word of base means to be humble. It deals with the condition of one's heart. The implication here is if you are not satisfied in your heart, if you cannot be humiliated in front of folk, you need to get your heart right. Paul says, I've learned to be a base. I've, I've learned to be depressed. I, I've learned to not be the one that's always got to be seen. Some people, some people got to have their name called and their names on the program. COVID-19 has made some changes in our church. When we do go back to church, we won't pass out programs so nobody's name will be on the program. When we, when we go back to church, we won't, we won't handle material and, and pass things from one person to the other because we are conscious of COVID-19. Somebody's going to get mad because their names are not called and their names are not on the program. Paul says, I've learned how to be a base. Then he says, I've, I've learned how to abound. Word abounds means how to excel. I've, I've learned how to, how to have access. Excess. E -X -S -S. I've learned how to have access. See, he, he says, I've learned how to do without when he said, I learned to be a base. And then he comes back and he says, I've learned to have leftovers. I've learned how to have excess. I, I've learned how to excel. I've learned, this word abound means I've learned how to have increase. You see, the order in which it's written, Paul is saying to us, you got to learn how to be humble in order for God to give you increase. He says, I've, I've learned how to abound. I, I've learned how to have over enough, and I've learned to have more than enough. He says, I've learned to have above enough. Let me tell you that some people can't handle much. Have you ever wondered why God hadn't given you what you've been asking him? The question is, can you handle it? How, why, God, why? Ask him. Ask him sometime. God, why haven't you given me what I've been asking you? Ask God, ask God, God, you know I've been asking you over and over again. I've been asking you for many years. And you have to ask yourself, why haven't God given me all that I've asked him? The question is tonight, can you handle it? Can you get all that God has asked you to, all you've asked God, for which you've asked God, can you receive all for which you've asked God and still be humble? Can you receive all that God would give you and still love God more than you love the creature? The problem, history, history shows many times, even Christians, many times get to a point in their lives where they will be changed by stuff. I've seen it often, even at the New Beginning Church. Pastor, you need to pray for me. All the members need to pray for me because you want me to have this job. We call a prayer meeting for them. Once they get the job, we don't see them at church anymore. Once they get the job, they're too tied up with the job. 
the job has taken first place in their life. And I keep telling us we have to keep God in first place. Yes. When you keep God in first place, you will learn how to abase and you will learn how to abound. You got to keep God in first place. When, when, when Paul says, I've learned how to be a base and I've learned how to abound, what he's saying in whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content because I've learned to be low and I've learned to be high. Yes. Some people can't handle lowness because they can't stand to be humiliated. Some people can't have handle highness or increase because they don't know what to do with it. And God has a way of blessing us even when we can handle it. He says, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I'm going to tell you, I, I never went to sleep hungry because I had to. But I've been told, drink some water and go to sleep. <laughs> Because when you're a growing kid, when you're a growing boy and you're very active, you eat up everything in the house. Sometimes I had to just drink water and go to sleep. And we learn how to live high and how to live low. Too many people, too many people will get a good job, make good money, and don't save any of it. We learned early on that a rainy day is coming. And let me tell you, if you hadn't noticed, the rainy day is here. Not only is it a rainy day, it's pouring outside. Matter of fact, it's storming outside. The rainy day that your foreparents talked about, they are pouring, it, that day is here. It's pouring up outside. It's, it's raining outside. Don't spend it all in one place. Don't spend it all in one time. And save some for another day. Paul says, I've learned how to be full and I've learned how to be hungry. I've learned how to make it on, on a little bit and I've learned how to make it on a lot. You see, when, when, when we have a recession, you can tell people who are prepared. And to my African-American brothers and sisters, you have no reason to make it. No reason to not make it, rather. Because you made it on a little of nothing. Well, our full parents made it on a little of nothing. You get your stimulus package. Don't, don't go, first of all, give God the first 10%. And don't go buy gold teeth, gold rings, tattoos with your money that you were given for your livelihood. That's not stimulating the economy. It's putting money back in the same hands of the people that had the money all the time. You got to learn how to be a base, how to be low. You got to learn how to be abound, how to have and, and have more. This word abound means to have overflow and keep it. Some people act like money burns their pocket. They can't, they can't keep it in there long. And they just got to give it up. Got to give it up. This word want, this word need means to be destitute. It says I've learned how to be in need. I've learned how to be destitute. I've learned how to be at my worst. I've learned how to be short. I've learned how to be behind. I, I've learned how to be in want. I have learned how to be full and how to be hungry and still live and still make it. And still be a part of this life that God has given us. Let me tell you, when you retire, you don't make as much money as you used to make. And some people just can't make it. Let me just share with you. Big Mama used to say, I am on a fixed income. But God fixed it. What she's saying is. I'm going to continue to give God what God requires me to give him, even on a fixed income, and I'm going to charge God to keep me in the midst of it. Yes. The worst time to not give is when you don't have but a little. You cannot afford to stop giving. Yes. You got to keep on giving. Mm -hmm. You sing the song all the time. You sing the song. The more he gives, the more I give, the more he gives unto me. You can't beat God giving no matter how you try. 
Believe that song. God, God has a way of blessing us in our weaknesses and in our strengths. And when we're full and when we're empty, when we're hungry or when we're satisfied, God can keep right on blessing us. Says, I've learned to be to be both abound and to suffer need. Then when you have a need, you suffer through some things. And when you suffer through some things, you understand real well that, that there's a brighter day ahead. God is gonna, gonna make a way somehow. And finally, here's your favorite verse. Philippians chapter four, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me just argue my case here. Whenever you look at a pericope, whenever you look at one main thought, the thought never, never strays from that thought. The words, the verses never stray from that thought. So if verse 10 is true, verse 13 is in the same thought pattern, so it has to be true also. But what you have to understand, many times we've looked at this verse in the wrong way. Look at the context. Look at the situation. Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, I mean the church at Philippi, he's saying to them, I'm so glad that you all have been revived again where you can continue to give to me. He's saying, I am so glad that I have learned to be content with whatever I have. Paul says, I've learned to be a base, meaning he's learned to be low. I've learned to abound, means he's learned to be ex exceedingly above and beyond with overflow. Now, verse 13 doesn't leave that same thought. It sticks with that same thought. Verse 13 says, and verse 13 says, says to us, as you have quoted so many times, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It has nothing to do, has, oh, that's terrible English. It has absolutely anything, no thing to do. It has nothing to do with you doing all things, everything through Christ who strengthens you. It has, you have to stay with the text. The text declares that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul is talking about the gift that the Philippians church gave him. He's saying, let me tell you, I've learned to be in need. I've learned to suffer. I've learned to want. I have learned also to be full. I've learned to be hungry. And I know you haven't given me anything lately, but let me just tell you this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But Paul says here, he says, I can do all things. This word, this, this phrase can do, he, mean, he means I'm able. I am available. I, I, I will prevail. He says, I can do all things. In other words, I will be made whole. I will have much work done through Christ who strengthens me. You see, they were supporting his ministry. And as they supported his ministry, he went about doing great works. Paul is saying, if you can't get the money to me, and if you're like other churches, you won't give the money to me. I tell you what, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know that's not what you want to hear. I know that's not how you've seen this verse. But you got to make sure that you keep this verse in the context of what is written. The Paul, Paul is saying, as many pastors will say, if you don't have it to give, it's all right. Now, that's the pastor saying it. It's not God saying it because you have to give to God because God has made it a requirement. But when it comes to the preacher, Paul is saying, if you don't give it, it's okay. Don't fall out about it. Don't get upset about it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know if I shot my head, myself in the head or the foot that time, but the one thing I do know, I got to stick with the text. And the text declares, Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, he says, 
I can do all things. I can be made whole. I, I can do much work. I can continue my ministry through Christ Jesus. For he gives me the strength to continue my ministry. When he uses the word through, he says, I can do all things through. I can do all things under. What Paul is doing is he, he's painting the picture of the fact that we must come under the supervision of Christ Jesus. This, this is a positional word. This is a, a positional word that tells us that we need to understand only under Christ can we do all things. And as we position ourselves under Christ, then these all things take place. He says, through, I can do all things through Christ. He says, I can do all things as I submit to Christ. He says, I can do all things as Christ becomes the instrument, the instrument by which I do those things. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stop saying you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you unless you're talking about it in the context of the text. Paul is talking to the church that gave to him regularly, gave money to him. And, and, and preachers are saying all over the world, I can do all things through Christ. What he's saying is, if you can't afford it, you don't have to give it. But God is saying the first 10% is holy unto him, so you have no choice. When it comes to giving to the preacher, Paul is saying that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. What he's saying is, if you won't give it to me, if you're just too stingy to give it to me, I can still press on through Christ who strengthens me. This Christ, this Christ he talks about is the Messiah. This Christ, Jesus Christ himself, he's saying that I can do all things through the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. Now he says, who strengthens, or who strengthen, or who strengthens me. This word strengthen means he empowers me. He's empowering Paul. He's enabling him, and he's increasing Paul. Paul is saying here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, as he has said, verses 10 through 13, Paul is saying in verse 13, that Christ strengthens me, Christ empowers me, Christ increases me. What he's really saying to, to the Philippian church is, if you don't send your money, Christ will be the one that make it happen. What he's saying is, Christ is the one that strengthens me in such a way until... Regardless of how we handle things, regardless of if you give your money to me or not, Christ is going to be one that increases me and lifts me up. Yes. Let me just share with you today. Is Christ the solid rock I stand? Mm -hmm. All other ground is sinking, stand. It's sinking. It's it's not it's not stable. We need to understand that if we're going to look forward to anything and anybody, we need to look to Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. Yes, I've learned a long time ago you really can't depend on a whole lot of people because people will let you down. You can't depend on a whole lot of family members because family members will let you down. You can't depend on a whole lot of friends because friends will let you down. Paul is saying to us tonight, Philippians chapter 4, through chapter 10, through chapter 13, Paul is saying to us tonight that Christ, the solid rock, is the only one you can stand on. Yes. He says, I can do all things. I can keep my ministry going through Christ Jesus. I, I can keep talking to people about the Lord through Christ Jesus. And Paul is saying this as he's on house arrest. Paul is saying this as he's locked in prison. Paul is saying this while he can hear Nero's chopping block about to take his neck off. Mm -hmm. Saying that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There may be somebody here today who don't have Christ in your heart. Mm -hmm. Who have never ever received Jesus as your personal Savior. 
You can't say these words today. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I say to you tonight. That if you trust him. Yes, sir. If you believe in him. You can be saved right here. Right now. You can get to know Jesus. For yourself. You can trust Jesus to be a part of your life. You can trust Jesus to guide your life. You can trust the Savior. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can get to know Jesus right now, right here. Without a church building, without a choir singing, you can get to know him. And then you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can do all things through Christ who gives us the power, who gives us the hope, who gives us the strength. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The door of the church is open. You ought to trust him. Trust him to be your savior. And you can do that by believing the story. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a skull hill called Calvary. Jesus Christ gave up the ghost on a cross over 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ died on Calvary's hill. They took him off the cross and he gave his life voluntarily and they took him off the cross. Laid him in a barber tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. This is not a fictional character. This is not a fictional story. Jesus did live, but he died. And he rose from the dead. The Bible says if you believe this story, according to Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, you'll be saved right here, right now. The Bible says, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, that these are the way to be saved. Get to know Jesus as your Savior. Believe that Jesus died. Believe that he was buried. Believe that he rose from the dead. And believe that he appeared to over 500 men at one time. The door of the church is open. You can get to know him. You can secure your place in heaven right here today. If you just believe this story. If you want to trust him today and be a part of the kingdom of God, just bow your head to me and repeat after me and invite him into your life. Just repeat, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you are born again. We want to welcome you to the body of Christ. Welcome you to the kingdom of God. And if you're listening to me today and you need prayer, please inbox me and let me know you need prayer. And we'll be praying with you and praying for you. If you're here today and you're listening to me and you don't have a church home or you're in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. You ought to get to know Jesus and become a part of a church family. If you want to be a part of this church, I will... Be glad to mail you a membership card and you can be a part of the New Beginning Church or email you a membership card and you can be a, a part of the New Beginning Church and you'll have a family of God with you and we'll be glad to have you. Please inbox me and let me know if you received Jesus as your Savior and let me know if you have, have committed to the New Beginning Church to be your church home. It is time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time for us to give to the Lord. There is, is an opportunity for us to share what the Lord has shared with us. It's time to give unto the Lord. And you can do so, and you can give unto the Lord by two methods. One or two methods. You can give unto the Lord by one or two methods. Methods. First of all, you can give by way of our cash app. 
Our cash tag is, our cash tag is, our cash tag is NBC Souls, cash tag NBC Souls. That's dollar sign NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. You can give by way of our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Uh, dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can mail your offering in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459. Uh, P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you again for joining us here tonight in our Bible study. You can meet us here every Wednesday night in our Bible study at 7.20 p.m. Meet us here. Same channels. You can meet us here in our Bible study, uh, 7.20 p.m. And on Sunday morning, our youth have our youth and our children have their Bible study during the week and on the weekends by way of Kahoot. They have their Bible study by way of a Kahoot, their Sunday school by way of Kahoot. And also, uh, you can have Sunday school with us at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. You can join us right here at these two stations on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live. 9 a.m. every Sunday. And then you can join our worship service at 1045 a.m. Our worship service at 1045 a.m. every single Sunday. You'll be glad to be a part of our services and we'll be glad to have you a part. Thank you so much for giving to the Lord and thank you so much for joining us here tonight. We want to continue to lift up the Holman Street Church and the, the family of Pastor Manson B. Johnson. We want to continue to lift this family and tell your family and friends to lift this family uh, uh, before the Lord as in the in the transitioning of Pastor Manson B. Johnson II of the Holman Street Church. And we want to lift up the, the Holman Street Church because whenever a church is vacant, that means there's no man in the pulpit. You see, the church is never vacant because the choir members are not there. That doesn't call for a vacant church. A church is never vacant because the deacons are not there. The church is never vacant because the, the choir musicians are not there. The church is never vacant because the ushers are not there or the greeters are not there. The only time you have a vacant church is when the man of God is not present. So we want to pray for the Holman Street Baptist Church because the man of God, it's no longer there. He has gone on to be with the Lord. We want to keep this church in prayer and keep the Johnson family in prayer as they travel through these terrible, these times of swift transition. I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for another privilege to share your word with your people. We ask you to bless your word, Father God, that it will convict, that it will console, that it will be cause, a cause for commitment. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we leave this place, but never leave your presence. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise God, the one who can make sure that we are strengthened through him, that we can do all things. Now unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we come again, let us join by saying, Amen, amen, amen. Thank you again for joining us. God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer.